Today on the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, the cinematographers will be talking to five talented directors of photography who are behind some of the season's most anticipated films. They are Barry Aykroyd for Captain Phillips, Faden Papa Michael for The Monuments Men and Nebraska, Bruno Delbanel for Inside Lewin Davis, Stuart Dryberg for The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and Sean Bobbitt for 12 Years a Slave. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, the Cinematographers. I'm Carolyn Jardina, and this is my colleague, Greg Kilday. Joining us today are Barry Aykroyd, Bruno Delbanel, Faden Papa Michael, Sean Bobbitt, and Stuart Dryberg. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. What would surprise people the most about a director of photography? They don't have a clue <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> this is a chance to tell people. I think uh, most people really have very little idea of what we do. I mean, I think people would be surprised uh, about the, the sort of the, the, just the breadth of requirement to be a cinematographer. Because it's not just cameras, it's not just film, it's not just lenses, it's all the technical side. But plus you're, you have all of the non-technical stuff, you're running a crew. You know, the interpersonal relationships that you have to develop. You're working with a director, with designers, with you know, hair and makeup and costume. There are lots and lots of things that you have to deal with as a director of photography. The filming bit of it is actually the easiest bit. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd throw into that you've also, the, the relationship between the camera and the, and the performance and the, and, the, and the story itself. So it, that's the bit I kind of find, it, it, you know, it's the thing you can't put your finger on, but it's the thing that is the most in, interesting to me. You know. You know, and, and in saying that, you want to get a good crew, don't you? You want to get good people around you. You want to have a good rapport with the director, and which and and but you know, when it's it's the moment when you switch the camera on, it's the exciting bit to me. You know, so. no, it is because the cam the camera is like the the, uh, the pen you're writing the story with. I mean, and, and you get to hold the pen. I mean, it's in this case the camera. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very very exciting position to be in. Well, when you're working with a director for the first time, how long does it take you to develop a rapport? Uh, how do you know you and a director are speaking the same language? Well, it depends on the director, but um, I mean, to go back to a, a person, I've done three movies now, Alexander Payne, I remember on Sideways, because he had worked with only one DP prior to that. It took about two weeks, because I would see where he would stand during rehearsal, and that's usually where he would want to place the camera. And, you know, it took me a while to figure, pinpoint that. So I would make sure, you know, already early in the rehearsal to try and place him in the right spot in the room. And it varies, you know, some, some people are very in tune with what you're doing. You're sort of going in and have the same instincts and others you have to find, you know, your common language. Bruno, for you, this was your first time working with the Cone brothers. What was your experience? It was great. <clears throat> I mean, they are amazing to work with. I mean, but they are well, <clears throat> well prepared. You know, they, they know exactly what they want. They do their own shot list, and uh, I mean, they, they suggested to me, as they did with Roger Deakins, obviously. And uh, so, it was it was fantastic. It's a bit harder with Tim Burton. You know, I, mean, I, I did two movies with Tim Burton, and he, you never really know what he want to do. You really want to block the scene before. Bef before you decide or commit to anything. So he blocks the scene with the actors. So you have to be very, very fast to react, you know, because he blocks the scene and then an hour later you're supposed to shoot or something. So you have to be a bit more flexible, let's say. But it's, I, I don't really try to understand the director. I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> you see, no, it's just because I, I don't think you can understand the director, really. I mean, you can support them, you can help them, you can try to translate what they have in mind into images. But, uh, you know, I don't understand Tim Burton. He has a special vision of things. And uh, even with the clients, you know, when I shoot this movie, I, uh, I said, oh, OK, it's a, it's a little lightweight comedy. And it turns into a requiem, you know. So it's really uh, a strange movie. And 
that's when they, they work with the actors and when they cut the movie, suddenly, at the end of it, when you see the movie, when you, when you start grading it, that's when you discover it and uh, it's a different thing. And that's the beauty of it because it means that you're, you're not um, the one who is driving everything. You know, they have their own vision, especially those kind of guys. You know, I mean, yeah. we all work with major directors and from my point of view, there is always a big difference from the script to the final result. And that's what is really thrilling and very interesting. Had to open your big mouth, huh, Funda Boy? I'm sorry, who are you? Oh! If I had wings, I'd know where I'd fly the river. Well, if the music's not. What? Quit? Just exist? What'd you say you played? Folk songs. Folk songs. I thought you said you were a musician. For you, Barry, uh, how, how did you and Paul prepare to shoot uh, Captain Phillips and working on water? We, we've all talked about doing some, some kind of water work like that. Yeah, it's, that's okay. It's part of nature. And I, my, one of the things I would always say is you can't fight nature. You just have to try and, you know, whether it's daylight or sunlight or, you know, the position of the, or night, you can't fight it. You have to kind of, go with it you know so that's I think that's what Paul likes about how I work you know he likes to just get the situation set up as real as, as can be I'll light it as much as in advance as I can and you'll light the whole sequence the scene and often because it's the third film I've done with Paul so uh, we you know have the same gaffer and we worked on on the last two anyway and we've you know we've just planned that when Paul says it'll be three people sitting around a table like this we'd have prepared to do the shot, that we'll come down the corridor and out into the street and and bring them in because he'll often say, "No, it's better if they're walking and talking now," you know. But he'll he'll throw that into to you at eight o'clock in the morning, you know. <laughs> you just think ahead and prepare ourselves. The good communication with the director is when you're saying very little. I think I don't know if everyone else agrees with that. It's just that moment where you you're understanding what's what what you're capturing in, in front of the camera. I, I don't know. When I operate the camera. I think we, we come we come from a tradition of that kind of work as well, I think, because we're mostly from the European tradition. I feel connected to the, the subject, and when, I'm, when it's working for me, all I have to do is, is glance across at Paul, and you just get that, that moment of connection. It's not a word or anything, you know. When I shot on the first film I did with him on United 93, again, another very physical and hard film, I was struggling really hard every, every take with these four-minute magazines, which we were reloading on, the, on a gimbal, you know, aeroplane and shooting and shooting for an hour. And I'd be completely worn out. I, and he'd walk onto the plane, because he'd be watching it on the little monitors. He'd walk onto the plane and just, he'd just brush past me and he'd go to the actors. He'd go, that was good, that was great, could do better. You know, Clemens Becker, the operator, he'd say, very good, Clemens. Very good. And he'd push past me again and walk off the plane. You know? And I was like, I, I guess you know, I must try harder, mustn't I? You know, <laughs> that's all you think, I've got to try harder. So, and I did every time, I tried harder and harder and harder until we were halfway through the film and, uh, and we had a little kind of halfway through the film party at Paul's house. And I met his, his great wife, Joanna, and I said, uh, I think it's going all right, but Paul doesn't talk to me. <laughs> and I said, I'm not quite sure. He said, what? He comes home, he gets in bed with me at night and he just talks about you. So, so I knew, <laughs> so then I realized it was all right. You know. Shot wide, take the hoses. This is not a drill, this is a real world situation. They come in the morning and say hi. They say, okay, so the first shot's going to be here. And then what's great with them is it's, uh, it's here. It's not here, it's not here, it's here. Yeah. So you know exactly where what you have to light. But uh, you do a couple of takes and then they say, okay, so that's it. Next, they don't say, "Oh, Bruno, that was fantastic." You know, they don't bother. No, no. I mean, they, and it's not the, the, the thing anyway. You know, even Tim is the same. You, they never say you have to ask, "Was it all? Was yeah, it yeah. all right?" And uh, do you like the, the kind of light I'm doing? So well, why are you asking? Yeah, 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 yeah it's okay. You know, so, but I, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do what he's doing. 
and I, I, I think that's no, but that's that's, that's, that's interesting yeah. because uh, yeah, we are all different, mm. and that's mm. what I like about cinematography. Mm. It's we are not expendable. You see, I mean, I have, I have my own style. Stuart has his own, Shem, Faden, and Barry. You know, we have our way of seeing things, but to, I'm I'm unable to do what he's doing. Really, it's not in my brain, you know, and, uh, yeah. and that's what I think is interesting. Yeah. Talk about establishing a rapport with the director and trying to get a sense of what the director is looking for. You gentlemen bring such expertise to your field. Have you ever worked on a movie where, in fact, the director was intimidated by you and knew he didn't have the knowledge that you had? That's not unknown um, because, well, particularly the first time director, um, they're being pushed to get someone a safe pair of hands. To, to do the film. But I think part of the job is to not intimidate them, yeah. to try and reinforce the fact that you're there for them. It's, it's their film. And part of the job is trying to figure out what your role is as the cinematographer with that specific director. Days ago, I was with my family in my home. Now you tell me all is lost. I don't know who I am. That's the way to survive. Well, I don't want to survive. I want to live. Our goal is to, to, to find what is in their mind in a way, whether they communicate it a lot or not at all, and, uh, and try and get as close as possible to that. How did you work with, with Sorry, Ben? <laughs> um, I mean, in, in the same way, you know, he's, he's a man with actually a, um, a very strong um, vision for the film, uh, visually as well as in terms of the, the arc of the story. He turns out to be a collector of photography. One of the you know, key elements, uh, one of the key characters is a photographer. Maintaining a, a sort of a photographic look to the film was, was very important to him. A lot of our inspiration was drawn from photojournalism, uh, you know, from the Life magazine archives, in fact. We have ahead of us the privilege of publishing the very last issue of Life magazine. Jumping up and down the floor. And for the final issue, we just received negative 25 from Sean O'Connell for the cover. It's 25. It's not there. I know. Every working relationship is different, and every the combination of cinematographer and director it's almost like you become one organism that is unique and maybe even unique to that particular film. It could be a different relationship and a different thing on another picture with the same two people. Uh, there, there's, it's uh, ever-changing dynamic. It's about telling someone else's story, but with your voice, you know, and, and I think that's, we secretly think we know what we're doing. <laughs> and we, but somehow, that, I think, but secretly, underneath, I think I must be doing something right because, because I'm here, you know, and we're here today, you know, so, so we prove right. that. You have to have a certain degree of arrogance to do it, but not one that makes you into a, a bully or someone, you know, and we would never dream of doing that to a, dire to a director because you have to make the film, you know. But you know, the thing with the first time director is to make the first time director understand that we don't want to be a director. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, <clears throat> okay, we are here to help. You know, we are here because we have a certain knowledge of something, which is, I don't know what it is, in fact, but uh, we know something. I mean, for me, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a director. No way. So it's easy with, a, you know, with Tim Burton or the Kind's brother. It's easy because they, are, they know what they want. But with a first-time director, it could be sometimes you have to step back a bit, you know, because you have to say, okay, why don't we do this this way? And then they can be just like uh, very reluctant and say, oh, you want to be the director of this movie? No, 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 no way. You know, I'm, I'm just suggesting but something. But we, we can offer, you know, my, my job is to offer things yeah, to yeah. them, and they're like little gifts, you want them or not. And, yeah. and often they say, no, that's not what I need. Or, yeah. or they go, that's great, thanks for that. So it's, you know, I think a, a lot of first time directors um, are finding themselves so it's difficult as a cinematographer to, to, to be absolutely accurate as to what your role is because they don't quite know what their role is. Yeah. So there's a little bit of dancing around from the beginning. And you know, some directors um, are only interested in actors and some directors are only interested in images. And most directors are somewhere in between that. 
And once you've kind of figured out where they, where they are on that scale, then you can start pitching your suggestions um, in a way that is helpful. If they have no interest in the camera at all, then you know, there's an awful lot of, of pressure on you um, but also, and, yeah, but also and it's not reward fun. sometimes, because if, if you get it right and it works, then you're not directing the film, but you're certainly guiding the film. But that, I don't know if that's as satisfactory. I mean, I, I prefer having somebody who knows what they want. I mean, a lot of people would think, oh, but that's great, you're working. Because I've had directors who literally said to me, I mean, one actually, who said to me, you do whatever you're doing, you do that thing you do with the light and the lenses. <laughs> and, you know, I can do it, but, uh, you know, that's not really my job. I'm going back to your original question where, you know, what is it what we do? I mean, I think there was a lot initially about what we do where people just didn't know. Uh, you know, everybody thinks they can edit, write, direct, you know, because they can see it and make judgments. But, you know, we were the guys with you know, light meter and a spot meter and a viewing glass, and they go, what do you do with it? You know, I mean, how often have we been asked that question still, you know? And now it's just changed because of technology. And, you know, a lot of people say it's not, they don't like that, you know, everyone can see when we shoot digital now, almost the negative, almost the final product and, and really comment on it. Whereas before, you know, you wanted somebody in silhouette or you were trying to achieve something and you would explain, okay, so, are you comfortable with this? He's going to be against this window. You want to see any details of this is going to be like this. And you were kind of describing it to them and you wouldn't see it till after the fact. And, and now you can actually, I actually think it's a useful tool to have a director be able to dial in the, the degree of what you want to see and, and sort of paint. It's a different creative process, but you can sort of paint on the monitor with your lookup table that you have in, in mind for the final product. So it's, it's just a different creative process. Is that always a good thing? Or sometimes is it distracting to have people looking over your shoulder? Well, it depends. If you're working with a director that is in sync with you, I think it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say it's a negative because you, you get other people that are not the core filmmaker group. You get you know producers or other people commenting on it. And then it becomes a little more complicated because you know suddenly you know, actors are getting involved, hair and makeup people are getting involved, wardrobes are getting involved, production designers are getting involved, which is also good, but the design of a director and the cinematographer should really be able to use that as a useful tool. But the problem is, I mean, our, my directors restrict other people from using it. Even with Alexander Payne, we don't have a typical video village. We have an onboard monitor and that's it. And I operate and, and, you know, it stays sort of like in the old way, like it happens around camera right there with the actors and all that. I never knew the son of a bitch even wanted to be a millionaire. You should have thought about that years ago and worked for it. Have any of you been in situations where an actor might go around the director to say, I'm concerned about how you're lighting me? Uh, and deal with you directly rather than go to the director? I, I, I have uh, very early in my career I had, um, uh, on, on the piano, in fact, um, Sam Neill was, was concerned that I was shooting him in too much in silhouette, but he <clears throat> felt that I, you know, we weren't seeing enough of his face in order to get the performance. But uh, luckily, Jane Campion came to my defense and said, no, I, Sam, I want it that way. Don't worry, we'll know what you're thinking. We've had monitors on set for a long time, but uh, which certainly helped opened up the possibility of people commenting on their own performance or producers or writers, whoever else was there. What I do miss about film as an originating medium is that there were the happy accidents in film that you would, you know, be pretty clear about what you'd captured on the day. But then when you see the dailies, there's something else, some quality in the way the, the flare, the sun flared in the lens or some reflections which you really hadn't even been properly aware of yourself and th that often some of the most beautiful images emerge from those what I would call happy accidents. Yeah. Well, it's also the, you know, there was a, a, a thing about trust between the cinematographer and the director. They trusted you to do your job. If they weren't gonna see the rushes till the next day, they would turn to you and say, are you happy with that take? And it would be, yes, I am, or no, I'm not. And that would be it. And, and now they now, don't do it anymore. As you yeah. described earlier, they just don't say anything. And when I worked with Ken Loach, we, Ken wouldn't see, we didn't watch any rushes. There was no video monitor, no playback. 
nothing at all on, on set. He saw the, he saw the rushes, his dailies, when he got back to the cutting room. Uh, we, they went to the editor and he, he might say, mm, that, that was a little bit dark, you know. And, uh, and then the great Clive Noakes, the great colorist at uh, Deluxe in London, you'd get on the phone and he'd say, no, I think it's okay. And he'd say, it's okay. Some of you most recently worked on film while many of your peers have moved to digital. What does that say? I just shot the Tim Burton movie with an, an Alexa. It was my first movie on digital. And uh, I did on Potter, I did, I did test the, all of them because of all the visual effects. We said, okay, we had so many visual effects, maybe we should use digital camera. So I tested the Dalsa, the Viper, the Genesis, all of them. And it was not as good as film. So it was seven years ago. With Tim, I had, uh, had a problem. We, we, we see too much with digital. And uh, that's what I hate. And so that's one of the reasons I don't like it so far. I mean, I shot at night and, uh, you know, I start lighting the same way I was on film. And it was, I have to stop down to 11 almost, which is ridiculous. And uh, at the end of it, I end up using a blonde instead of 220Ks. And, and, uh, and even, that's what I said yesterday, you know, on, on the monitor it was brighter so that, than what I could see with my own eyes. And I said, there is something wrong here because I have no, um, I can't trust nothing. Uh, I can't trust my eyes because the camera sees more. I have to rely on something which is a piece of equipment, which is a monitor. Mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, and then, so is the monitor is not calibrated properly and if it's blah, 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 I mean, Everything is made to, f to fall. <laughs> and so I like, I like film for that. You also said, though, that um, you actually shot Tim Burton's film digital because there wasn't a lab available. Do you want to talk about that issue? Oh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's uh, wow, we need three hours. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a long topic. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the problem with, with what's going on now is uh, we're going from watchmaking if I may say so, a Nariflex camera or a Panavision camera were like a, a Swiss watchmaker, you know? It was really precise. It cost a fortune, you know, $300,000 a camera. And now we're going to use camera which is going to be $2,000. The problem is it's not, um, it's an economical decision. It's not uh, an artistic decision. So Kodak going to shut down because it's all about marketing now, about money. and. Uh, Obviously, if I was a producer, I would better buy a $2,000 camera than a $200,000 camera. Because That being said, though, the, the actual production costs, no matter how much the camera costs, the production costs in digital and film is still quite comparable. Change that will come is going to be, you're saying you see too much on a 2K sensor. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the changes to the 5K, the 8K, 16K, wherever it goes, like, there's a point where your eye, you, you've gone beyond the chemical, physical world. The thing about film that we love is, is because it works in a chemical and physical way. You can carry so much of it on your shoulder because it's made of celluloid and, and chemicals. The chemicals burn up in a way that are very comparable to your eye, cone, rods and cones in your eye burning up. So it's very sympathetic to the eye. It gives you that grain and texture that we're kind of used to in, in our real lives, you know. And we're gonna lose that. You know, maybe someone will keep making film stock, but I don't think cameras are gonna die. I think film cameras are gonna die. I think we're gonna to have to somehow work around this over-engineered, over... Because, because technology isn't just about progression. You know, because you can progress, it's about doing the right thing. And I don't, I don't but I don't think we're something. just gonna continue to improve the image uh, at a rate that we have been, because people already are saying, you know, this is starting to look strange. You know, it's too sharp. But these TV, the TV screens I see in a hotel room. Oh, those, oh, those are horrible now. Those, uh, everything, even that was shot on film, I was staying at the hotel and they had the new LCD and everything looked like it was uh, like video. But, you know, people are, even non-cinematographers are starting, my, I mean, my wife is starting to say, why does this look like this? And I mean, and I, I you know, when, when the projectors and the cameras get to a point where you're picking up too much detail and things are too sharp, I think people are 
going to respond to it somehow. And I don't yeah. think there's a need to keep uh, yeah. developing it. Uh, you know, on Nebraska, which, you know, I, I shot on Alexa, but with old Panavision lenses and a more fixy series and stuff. You know, I shot black and 52-22, I shot uh, color stock, and we, we went all the way through out to, to, to uh, negative print. Uh, you know, I was able to find uh, a path to make it look like the 5222, but you know, it was a, a big process, and now I'm using electronics to, you know. But you know, that's, that's, that's what's wrong, that's, that's what's wrong, in fact, you know, because uh, we, we I'm, I'm saying the opposite of what I'm saying, basically, which, which is, you know, we have, a, we're using digital camera, and we want it to look like film. So how, how contradiction is that? You know, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And we, we, we came to using filters just to blur the image a little bit because the lens are too sharp. So it doesn't make sense. I would love film to stay, you know, and, uh, just because it's another medium. But we have to learn the language of, of digital somehow. There is a language to it. it uh, on the Guns Brothers, I did, uh, I did a test on 16 mil because we wanted to shoot on 16 mil. At the very beginning, we, we didn't have the budget for 35 mil, so we said, okay, let, let's try Super 16. And I did the test and I, I screened it with uh, Joel and Ethan, and I said, oh, I made a mistake, I have to redo it. You know, it's, so that was grain, as big as this. You know? And uh, so I said, I, I, I really made a mistake. So I did the test again, and it was the same size, <laughs> the same dot like that. Uh, and they, You're not used to it, anymore. <laughs> exactly. And I realized that we are not used to seeing those images. And so I said, OK, so the new generation of you know, the kids, my daughter is nine years old, and she used to watch, I have a big plasma at home as well, and uh, she's used to watch those kind of images. So, so this generation, when they're going to see faces, you know, like the Casavetes movie, yeah. black and white with gray, in you, they said, it's horrible. That's what they're going to say. So to sum up your message to manufacturers who are pushing 4K, 6K, 8K, your message is stop. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's anyway. So <laughs> what, would you like, what would you tell them? I don't know. I mean, they will go ahead and we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll work around it, I guess. I guess that's what we'll do. I, mean, not it, I think we've all shot digital. We've all shot film, obviously, because that's all we ever had one time, you know. So, um, you know, I feel there'll be a generation who who will only ever shoot digital, and they'll make they'll make great great films. You know, yeah. you know. I think what we should be also getting to talk about because it shouldn't be too technical. This is that we need good scripts and good films and good filmmakers. You know, and that and whatever whatever machines we use, will it'll will make good films out of that. You know, so we, uh, like we have no we have no say in what the technical changes will be. Nobody listens to. Three D. For or against? Well, there's no doubt. Uh, against. against. <laughs> no doubt. Well, I, I wouldn't say against, but just a bit uh, mystified. Large, usually, usually unnecessary. Rarely, rarely very successful. I think Avatar, which was, you know, which is responsible for the whole resurgence of, of 3D, is very successful in 3D and really enjoyable. But in most cases. It's fairly unnecessary. I think. A gimmick. It's, it's really a gimmick ever. that's uh, yeah. pro led by production producers. I mean, and uh, and not you know it sells uh, tickets are a little bit more expensive. I think that's the that's the desire. Well, actually, there's a theory that uh, I can't confirm it, but it's a, a sort of conspiracy theory. But actually, the studios were pushing 3D uh, products because it forced uh, the theaters to change over to digital projection in order to be able to show their product. So they made these big commercial movies that you could only play. Because there was initially this argument, uh, studios want to eliminate film, so they don't have to make all these prints and ship them all over the world. And then you know it was, well, who's going to pay? You're benefiting from having digital. Now we're sending a little hard drive that's the size of an iPhone. And and this, the theaters are is a big cost, you know, for us to get rid of all our projectors and, and put in these expensive digital projectors. So you guys should pay for it to the studios because you're benefiting from it also. So I think part of it was let's create a product that they need to update, you know. And now even and I'm saying because on, on Nebraska I'm like, how many prints are we actually making? You know, we're making like ten, and and. And I'm like, what about Europe? Like, and you know, I and so I asked 
people at the studios, like, how, how about all these markets that haven't really been able to switch over? They go, well, you know, it's the out of luck, get with it or you're out. The other problem with the labs all shutting down, because, you know, they can't, no one's making prints and, and, you know, we still have a front end, which is a processing, which still allows us, like on Monuments Man, I actually shot film and digital, and I was able to do that, but it was still a problem because, uh, you know, even, even in London and stuff where, I mean, they're shutting down the, they only have processing. Rooms. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's practically gone in London. Yeah, but in Paris, we're, we're hoping the French will keep this. <laughs> I mean, I was in I was in Berlin and 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 and, and uh, Airy Lab in Berlin was still printing for me, but uh, you know, it's it's that's becoming a problem. You know. I have to put a team together and do our best to protect buildings, bridges, and art before the Nazis destroy everything. How many men? Six. Jesus. Well, with you at seven, that's much better. From the movie theater point of view. They said, well, now, now we have to have uh, the, the film we saw actually on Blu-ray to us. You know, they, so we watched the Blu-ray, they have 35, 16, I think you have 8 mil projection there, because it's a proper cinema place. But well, the films will only come to them as a key, digital key. And they will now, you know, it's 2K, and in the, maybe next year or the year after, they'll have to upgrade to the 4K. And what was actually, in a sense, sinister is that then you can't, you know, you could find a film that's never been in some archive and you won't know how to, to look at it, you know. That's you you know, the, really right to the clock, the, the watch, you know, analogy, a 35 mil projector, you blow the dust off it, switch the light on, you know, the magic of cinema parody. So you lace it up and it projects the film and it's the most beautiful sound and sense and <laughs> smell, and all those things to us. You know, then the studios will have control over those keys. And will they will they provide every film that's ever been shot that belongs to them in their archive? You know, will they say, yeah, it's all available to you? We just we're we're just going to do that. You know, we're, this very obscure film is still available for not just for students but for pe people who want to watch every kind of film. Are we only going to be able to watch the studio films that they want to release? And you know, will the independent cinema just die away because they don't have access to that kind of key to the key? It's literally a kind of yeah. Because, because that's the, the advocates, and I've heard people in, from the academic world uh, advocate for, for digital distribution because they say this could be the rebirth of repertory cinema. Mm -hmm. That everyone, you know, as you say, in theory, every, every film that's ever been made could be delivered on, in an envelope. Uh, and that you could have a small cinema in a small town that ran a different movie every night. Yeah. But I share your skepticism yeah. about whether that will suit the marketplace. Every film has to be transferred. And then that have, have, any of you, have any of you worked on a film, say 10 years ago, and it comes out on Blu-ray and you look at it and think, this isn't the film I shot, that's not what it should look like? Always. Yeah, yeah. Always. yeah, yeah. have you watched it you know, in the wrong format, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's always like that. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know about you, but uh, when I was grading on film before, I, I even went to the same screening room in the lab because from one projector to another, uh, you know, the mirror or the lamp, or blah, 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 the projector was different. So if you, have a, if you want a reference, you always went to the same room, you know, and the same with the DI, you know, the best, the best screening is in the DI room. And you know that that's the best place to see it and you will never see it again this way. So what is it to, to devote your lives and your career to kind of creating this image that you know exists only momentarily in its absolute best state, that it may, it may never be seen by most people <laughs> the way you would like it to be seen? Well, it, at least you get a chance to see it once. Yeah. I mean, and all you can do is hope then that people will see a, an approximation of that. And, you know, I've, I've been to, to screenings where I've had to get up and walk out um, because the, 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 I just couldn't bear to watch the film in the state it was in. But at the end of the screening, people would come out and say, oh, that was fantastic. That was beautiful, you know, well done and everything else. And you're thinking, well, you know, if only they had seen the real thing. Yeah. So it's... It, you know, I, I think we, we would drive ourselves mad yeah, we yeah. if we if we worried too much about it. I think it. there's four stages of, of a film. It's the, that 
the stage starting at the script, which I think we have to we shoot and we have to improve, and that's the stage we love. And the, you know, then there's the edit, which creates another a third film, which no one who started it at the beginning of the process knew what that was going to be either. We've discussed that. And then the fourth film is the one that the audience take away with them. And we make films for an audience. We don't make them so... That's, that's I, I don't make a film for myself to sit around and watch. I don't even like, you know, like, like musicians and actors don't often want to see or hear what they do. They, you, once you've done it, and you've, you can release it into... You can let go of it, you know. And often it'll take four or five years where you might catch the film again and then you see, what, then you'll understand that that's what I did that five years ago, yeah. and I, you know, and it was good or bad, whatever you think of it. But you'll never know really until some time has elapsed, because there's a, the process that you're involved in is only one of those processes. You know, looking around the table, like a real masterpiece from everybody here. That's, you know, that would live in the history of cinema forever. You know, and that's what I think is is moving to me that you've actually you've actually spoken to a, an audience you've heard people come out of that audience with and it's changed their lives a little bit. we're more in the moment of making the film than reflecting on it 10 years later i mean yes i i, I hope that the work that we do will live on and people will see it and that somebody figures out how to archive digital material in a way that you know it actually has a chance of being seen in the future but but I, I don't know if you guys would agree, but for me, the, the, the moment of creation is, is, is what I get a charge from. It's not sitting back yeah. and watching it later. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No, and I, I, it's, I find it very difficult to watch my films because all I see are the mistakes. Yeah. You know, and I'm very critical of, of what I do. So there's not an awful lot of enjoyment involved in, when I look at it. And, you know, those, those really little things that no one else will ever see but mean something to me are the things that stick. So I'd... Um, you know, I, I, it's, um, I'd rather watch other people's films. Could each of you name a, a film or a director who, when you were getting into, into filmmaking, kind of really inspired well, you? I'd have to say Ken Loach, of course, because he, he gave me my first real break. I, I learned everything. Chris Menges is my mentor because Chris taught Ken Loach how to make films. Ken taught me how to make films. So, you know, and... You know, and I still have this link to that. So it's not just the cinematography. It's I'm very passionate about political filmmaking and making films that the world want to actually listen to. You know, and I think so. All that comes from Ken Loach. Simple, simple answer from from me. Yeah. Oh, I think it's uh, it's Tarkovsky. That's um, he's the ultimate director. I mean, he for me he's the master because he used every uh, way of telling a story. He have very long takes, he used light, he used acting, he used everything. He's the ultimate director for me. What movie is about is uh, not to do, to do coverage as we do now. I mean, I don't do coverage, but you know, why do you want to do a, from a master to a two shot or a single shot you know, when you could do? That's what you did on Anger that I thought was fantastic when there is a discussion between, it was a priest or a priest. A priest. So, I said, oh, you're going to hold this take. He, he, he's, he's not bold enough to hold this take for a long time. And he did it. I said, that's brilliant. And you know that there is a relation between the money you had to do it. And, uh, but it's a bold decision. Let's hold it. And uh, I, I think that's, that's, great cinema, that's great movie making. And the, the shot was beautiful on top of it. But it's uh, just like, yeah, that's it. That's, what movies about. And he told a great story in, in, it, in, inside that. So everything, everything works together and that's yeah, when great yeah. cinematography yeah. exists. Yeah. I think. That's, but that's why we need the directors to do it. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. as yeah. cinematographers, we can't do anything alone. So yeah. no, we need to find... It, but, yeah. Of course, so but we need the director yeah. to be part of it and we can tell the director this film would be nice on Super 8 and, and then it'd be also nice if they we get them involved in that part of production. And, yeah and uh, put their foot down like we it was a big struggle for us to do a movie in black and white i mean yeah. and yeah. and we actually you know it almost fell apart because of it because yeah. alexander insisted on it. but you know I, I think we all are fortunate enough to work with directors that have made their mark and and maybe have enough power of making these decisions and hopefully we can hold on to to the the pain we want to with mm. their participation we won't be able to do it on our own but uh, hopefully we 
the yeah. director will. Yeah, we, we've been fortunate because we've we've well we've lived through that point of transition. We're living through that point of transition, mm. and there was a period um, which is fast disappearing where we had those choices, phenomenal choices. There's yeah. No other time in history has cinematographers had that choice, and it's a shame, like you're saying, to lose that. I don't understand why film has to die for digital to succeed. Yeah. You know, it, it, I think there's been a bit of a rush to the lifeboats, as, as you know. Uh, with, you know, the, as I say, with these labs closing in the southern hemisphere, I, I think because I think that um, film is going to continue to have a life. It is going to continue to be a choice that many directors, forget us, mm -hmm. but many directors will will yeah. will still say, I, you know, think this should be on film. People still like the tech. You know, we, we shot Walter Mitty on film. I don't know. It might be my last, you know, major film project. You know, Ben was very clear that he wanted to make, to shoot this on film again, because it had, you know, the photography was at the heart of the story. And I think also as a, an actor director, and I think a lot of actors agree with this, that they look at themselves on screen shot digitally and they look at themselves on screen shot on film and they go, you know what, I look better on film. And they're actually right. Because digital, it goes to this thing of, of oversensitivity, that the digital <coughs> sensors now are so sharp that you start seeing lines on people's faces that really aren't there. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you guys have had that. I mean, I've, I've, I find myself using diffusion filters that I haven't used in 20 years just to, to be you know, kinder to the, the faces of the people I'm photographing. Um, uh, and it's it's weird. It's not because you're trying to make them better than they are in person, although of course you always are. You're actually fighting the tendency of the digital camera to make them look worse, which is, yeah. I mean, I I think that's a yeah. a big problem. Yeah. It's a big problem. The, you know, the people who build cameras are trying to build the sharpest, brightest, yeah. crispest. Yeah. Uh, you know, and again, you know, film. Same with the lenses. Yeah. And with lenses. Well, as you say, you you shot your film with old Panavision lenses. Vantage Film, who I've done a lot of work with in recent years, have started building lenses, uncoated lenses, brand new lenses that are like, they're essentially trying to build an antique lens from scratch that will have worse contrast, more flare, poor ability to resolve. To to yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 and do all the it, things that we, we you know, Try not to do uh, while we're on the subject of actors and actresses, uh, do they talk to you about this? Do you have to reassure them about how they're going to be lit and how they're going to be? You know, the relationship yeah, right. with, with actors is like, is the same with directors. You know, they're, they're, everyone is different. And the relationship you develop with them is in reference to what they need. So of course you're trying to, to put them at ease. I mean, I always look at Bonner, it's, it's the, you know, the role of cinematographer is to create the space in which the actors then move and give them the freedom exactly to find the performance and, you know, try and keep them in frame as best you can. But also to give them the confidence that everyone around them is supporting them. So it's, it's really, you know, trying to, um, to, to, to ensure that they have everything they need to, to create the performance, to tell the story. To, to move the film on. And often we are the first human face that they see in terms of reaction because what's happening because of this technology is that the director often is not even on set. I mean, he's removed or in a black tent. So, you know, when you cut, when they hear cut from the other room, they look up and our face that comes off the eyepiece is the first person that they have, you know, the actors so they can feel you know what you feel about it so in a way you become their first sort of feedback to their performance you know just uh, no matter how you know we're not we're not great actors so you know they can <laughs> they, they can you know if we come off and we go like this and you know they know it something was yeah, yeah. so how, how quickly do all of you jump into a new movie I don't know, I'm, I don't, don't have a job yet, <laughs> right now. I've just done three films since Captain Phillips, but yeah, then, then no, you know, three small films. So. I, I like to use the term unemployed for the rest of my life as far as I know right now. Yeah. <laughs> I always think hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for spending time with us today. To learn more about the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, visit thr.com.